Um, next presentation is about Razer. And there, there, directly after this presentation, we have the next presentation without break. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's, that's David Litter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, das Essen ist mir nicht bekommen. Luttercourt. Sorry. Hi, I'm uh, David Luttercourt. <laughs> um, yeah, a little bit about me. I'm German, um, but I've been living in, this, in the States for much longer than I care to admit. Um, so it's great to you know, come back for an occasion like Puppet Camp here. And I'm actually really amazed to see how, you know, how big the event is and how many people are here. It's you know, really gratifying to see how much interest there is in Puppet and all things config management. Um, I've been with Puppet Labs for about six months now. Um, before that, I was at Red Hat for a really long time. Um, I was one of the earliest contributors to, to Puppet. Um, it was actually, I think, two, eight years ago today, well, the day before Thanksgiving, eight years ago, that I was looking at various config management systems because the only thing I had seen at that point was CF Engine, and that seemed clearly not great. Um, and back then, there were things around like BCFG2, something called LCFG, something from CERN that I never quite understood. It came with like a 500-page manual. Um, and then Puppet. And I mean, what struck me about Puppet at the time was that Luke seemed to have a really good handle on the problem and was very good at expressing you know, the problem he was trying to solve and how he was approaching it and all that, um, which you know, appealed a lot to me. Along the way, you know, I got frustrated with some aspects of like, managing files with Puppet, and so I wrote, wrote Augeus. Um, if you're still editing config files with set and grep, stop doing that right now and you know, go have a look at Augeus. It's a much better way to do that, much safer. But I'm here to talk about provisioning. Um, how many of you manage physical hardware? OK, um, that's a good, good swath. And I assume most of you provision them with pixie booting. Um, yeah. How many of you use a homegrown tool to do that? Okay, cobbler. Okay, anything else? Probably Xcat. Does anybody use Xcat here? I hadn't heard about that until a few months ago. Um, yeah, so provisioning is clearly a problem. Um, I don't, yeah, there's quite a few tools out there. Um, I don't think that um, many people are happy with the tools they have. And kind of to prove that point, I made up a user survey. And with make up, I mean, I mean invented the data um, <coughs> to prove that yeah, something needs to be done. Um, this, is, this is actually how, how, how you do software engineering in case, total aside, but yeah. <coughs> This is you know, how, how results in software engineering come about, usually. Um, but yeah, Razor was started about a year and a half ago by um, two people at then EMC, then now at VMware, Nick Weaver and Tom McSweeney. Um, was launched May, May of last year at EMC World, and then Nick gave a talk about it at PuppetConf last year, which was really well received. You know, lots of people there, lots of excitement around the tool. Um, I think very justified, um, and as part of you know, kind of moving on, because Nick and Tom aren't really in the business of um, maintaining software, especially not for production. Um, they kind of handed the code to Puppet Labs, and when I came on in May, my first, the first thing I had to do or was asked to do was look at Razor and figure out how we can put that into the product, into Puppet Enterprise, and um, you know, fix a few warts along the way. Um, and that's what I've been up to together with a guy called Daniel Pittman. You know, the two of us are kind of the Razor, uh, the main force behind Razor right now. So what makes Razor unique is, I don't know if m how many of you have heard the whole pet versus cattle thing, usually in the context of cloud. Um, but that's, that's what um, Razor tries to do. One of the things that makes existing Pixie provisioning solutions really annoying is that they force you to treat your servers as pets. right? You're, you know, a pet has a name, and you care for it, and when it gets sick, you take it to the vet, and you know, you, you're very, very concerned and very attached to it. And a lot of Pixie provisioning solutions force you to think the same way, right? If somebody comes and says, I need a database and a web server, you go in the data center and go, yeah, maybe that one over there and this one. Then you go back to your office, look at the sp spreadsheet where you have all your machines or your asset tracking system. 
um, enter the MAC address of these systems into your provisioning tool, and you know, at some point you have something installed on there. And what Razor does is it lets you treat, um, treat these machines much more like cattle, yeah, like this. Um, not as cute as pets, um, but yeah, in a lot of ways easier to deal with. Um, yeah, and just as there are cattle that, you know, you raise some cattle for meat and some for milk and you know, some for breeding, probably. Um, Razor lets you look at various aspects of your systems and kind of pick what you want, uh, what you want to use for certain things, um, depending on attributes of these systems. How much memory does it have? How many CPUs are in there? You know, those kind of things. Um, so that you can you know, kind of forget about you know, it's that individual server and more. I need a database, and databases go on machines that look like this in my data center, that you can set up policies like that. Um, and all that is yeah, Razor's driven by policy, which is, you know, again, based on rules. One of the things that makes Razor, I think, unique in the provisioning space is that we when a machine boots for the very first time, we boot it into a little discovery image, a little Linux image that in Razor speaks called the microkernel. Um, we boot it into that, and it runs factor and sends the facts back to the server. And then in your policy, in your rules, you can say, you know, you can match based on facts of a system, um, which you know, gives you a nice tie into how a puppet does things. Um, and you know, based on these rules and policy, you select what should be installed on there. Should it be CentOS 6.4 or you know, Debian or ESX or what, what have you? Um, and at the end of the installation, you can hand the machine off to a broker, which you know, usually is uh, or usually a config management system, usually Puppet. So there's a really easy way to, you know, to bootstrap your infrastructure from powering it on um, to all the way to it's enrolled with Puppet, uh, the whole thing gets automated um, with Razor. Okay, so what, what does the thing look like? Um, even though it's Pixie provisioning, what we deal with is a web server, and I'll get into how we get out of the whole TFTP misery in a minute. Um, so the main Razor code is just a garden variety web service. Um, using HTTP, we use Postgres as the database. How many of you have looked at the old incarnation of Razor, the, you know, the one that was initially launched? The, the initial thing had you know, a lot of web scale stuff in there, like you know, MongoDB and Node.js, and part of what you know, I want to or wanted to change uh, to productize it was get rid of a lot of these things, because what we learned is that there's not that many people who feel comfortable um, operating MongoDB, for example. Um, it was really hard to set up. Um, when I, at a talk like this, when I asked who's using it, a couple people asked, does, does trying to install count as using it? That's how hard the old co code base was. Um, with the new code base, it's, yeah, it's, an, it's written in Ruby. It's a fairly standard Ruby web application. We use Postgres as the database, um, for one, because I think lots, lots more people know how to, to run and operate Postgres, how to take backups, you know, disaster recovery, all those things are pretty well known. Um, two, I'm, I'm really impressed by Postgres, how they kind of took the challenge that this whole NoSQL thing threw down for relational databases. There's, over the last few years, there's a lot of features have shown up in, in Postgres that go towards like schema-less things, so that you know, in, in a lot of cases you don't need to kind of leave the comfort of a relational database to get you know, a lot of flexibility. Anyway, so Postgres is the database. Um, anybody who's ever deployed um, Ruby applications knows what kind, uh, what veil of tears that is with passenger and thin and you know, all unicorn and whatnot. Um, what we're doing is instead of using one of those, we use Torquebox, which is kind of a plugin for JBoss um, that turns JBoss into a Ruby app, app server. It's you know, as a developer, it's a really nice platform to develop on. <laughs> it means we're yeah, it means you're running a JVM. It also means that we're using JRuby. Um, the you know, usual uh, MRI Ruby seems to sec fault a day before you release you know, pretty reliably. Um, so yeah, JRuby, uh, Torquebox, and then as the web framework, we use something called Sinatra. If you haven't come across it, it's, uh, you can think Ruby on Rails after a very, very serious diet. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a really nice framework to write simple web services. Okay, so to set the thing up, 
you, know, you need Postgres, all the other things on the previous slide you kind of get uh, with a release. Um, you also need to do some preparations um, for your machines to talk to the web server, because Pixie booting, of course, requires DHCP and then TFTP, and then you're off to the races. Um, so what, we need, you know, what you need to do, what Razer doesn't do, is we don't try at all to manage a DHCP server, we don't try to manage a TFTP server, but at the end of the day, you have to put two files on the TFTP server. One is the iPixie firmware, which is a little binary that you, you know, get from the iPixie project, open source firmware. Um, and the other one is a little script for iPixie that the server will generate for you. And once you have these two files in place, you don't have to touch DHCP, TFTP ever again. Everything important happens on the, on the Razor server. The, nice, the, the, kind of, the, the thing that makes this possible is that iPixie lets you go from you know, TFTP um, where your machine downloads the iPixie firmware, and then that script basically says, talk via HTTP to the Razor server. Um, and the nice thing about iPixie is that it, that it lets you do that, that it lets you talk HTTP from a you know, pretty basic pre-boot environment. Um, what you'll you know, wind up with is you'll have a bunch of nodes, the systems that get managed by Razor, you have clients, which might be your laptop, which you use to control Razor to set up policy and, and things like that. Um, and that's uh, kind of what a, um, what a deployment looks like. The, the node is, is the central concept in, in Razor. You know, when it's bound to a policy, meaning we've installed something on it, um, we note that in the database we store some, some metadata about it, like the facts. Uh, and a couple other things in the database, and you can query all that through the API. Um, yeah, so th those are the machines we manage. And when a machine comes up for the first time, it does the usual Pixie boot dance, um, it gets the iPixie firmware and the little script, and then goes to the server, hey, I'm here, what should I be doing? Um, and as the first thing, the server sends down the microkernel, um, which it used to be based on tiny core Linux, which is a little bit of an off-the-beaten-track uh, distribution, um, which has the disadvantage that there's a lot of hardware out there that the tiny core kernel doesn't deal with. Like, you know, if you have Dell and HP systems and you know, um, Nix and HBAs in there that you know, that kernel doesn't like. Part of the rewrite we're doing is um, that we've changed the microkernel from using tiny core Linux to Fedora because that kernel is much more widely used, and ultimately, if we run into troubles, it's a very easy way to go to RHEL. Because Puppet, you know, we can't be in the business of hardware support for you know, low-level operating system stuff. Um, there's companies that do that, Red Hat's one of them, um, and it, most of our customers have RHEL contracts anyway, so by turning the, putting the microkernel on RHEL, um, you, can, you know who you have to call up if things go wrong with your hardware and some driver doesn't work, or where things don't happen. Um, yeah, so the microkernel is a fairly stock, right now it runs about 130 megs, fairly stock image, and we st stick a little uh, Ruby script in there that basically doesn't do anything else, but it runs factor, sends the facts back to the Razor server, the Razor server thinks about them, and then comes back with a command and tells the, the microkernel what to do. And the commands are really, right now, hang tight, there's nothing to do, or reboot because you know, the server wants to provision something on there, wants to install an operating system on it. The, um, in the future, we'll add more commands. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, the thing about the microkernel is once, it's, you know, once you've got the machine booted into it, it will continually check in with the server. By default, every 15 seconds, it will run factors, send the facts, ask, is there anything for me to do? If not, wait a little bit, do the same thing again. Um, which gives you really fast reaction times if, some, you know, if you change something on the server in the policy and all of a sudden that machine should run a data, should have a database on it or something like that. The, the gap you know, between the machine noticing that it should do something and you setting it up is you know, on the order of seconds. Okay, on the... So there, there's two APIs that the server uses and depending on what, you, what you're trying to do, they're, they're of different importance. On the, kind of, on the client side, there's a RESTful interface that you use to look at your nodes, to set up policy, to, you know, to um, 
yeah, we'll get into to policy in a, in a little bit. Basically, to control the whole thing, kind of the management API for, for Razor. And on the back end, there's a little API that the node can use when, it, uh, when it's installing something to get you know, additional information, additional, additional files. Before you can install something with Razor, you have to set up a few things through this REST API. One is a repository, which is you know, where the bits live that you want to install on there. You can either take like a Ubuntu install ISO and import that into the server or point the server at an existing repository that you already have. Um, that's the repository. The broker is the thing that at the very end kicks in to hand, your, you know, basically to tell something else. This thing is ready now and this is what it looks like. Do something with it. Usually you set up a puppet broker so that at the very end of installing on that, um, the, the node goes to the puppet master and says, hey, I'm a new node, and here's some information about me. Do something with me. Um, but there's, there's one guy who's written actually really interesting broker that just broadcasts stuff on a message bus via you know, some AMQP plugin. So you can, there's a lot of flexibility there what you can do with these brokers. Um, tags are actually the rules that policy is based on. So tag says if the machine has you know, more than two processors and more than 16 gigs of RAM, call it a big machine or you know, call it a such and such machine. And then later on, the policy says machines that are tagged with these tags um, should get this, uh, this operating system installed on them. And installers finally are the, the things that actually do the installation and they're little more than whatever you use for it to do automated installation of your systems. So if you're doing a RHEL or CentOS install, the installer is a kickstart file and maybe some post install shell script that you, you want to run once the node reboots. Um, but it's, you know, if you have the installation of your, of your operating system automated, the installer is like five, five lines of YAML, YAML metadata that you have to add. It's, you know, very, very lightweight. Okay, so the microkernel has been sitting there sending facts and been, been told um, there's nothing for you to do yet. We've set up all these things on the, on the server um, and now you know, a policy applies. We've determined that something, say RHEL, needs to be installed on that, on that node. The, uh, the server says to the node, reboot. And when the, when the node comes back and says, hey, what should I be running? The server now tells it, you know, here's an initRD in kernel, which happened to be the, the um, initRD in kernel for the rel installer, for example. And then from there, uh, it downloads a kickstart file. And there's, uh, as I said, there's a little API um, that the node can use to get things. Like there's, you know, you can, in the installer, you can have ERB templates for your kickstart file, for example, or some other files that you might need during the installation. Um, so you can fetch that. Uh, you can store some information about the node on the server, like the IP address um, of that node, if you want to have that in the database on the, on the server, which will then later show up in the, in the um, client-side API when you look at that node. You can log messages, right? You can say, oh, I successfully downloaded this script, I successfully installed some packages, um, whatever, or log some error messages that get attached to the node on the server. Um, and then finally, you can tell the server that you're done with a certain stage of the boot process, that you've, you know, you've done the basic installation, the node's now ready to reboot and run a post-install script. All the, the installers are really just linear sequences of steps that say, first you boot into this image, then you boot into that, and then yeah, after that, after a certain point, you'll always boot locally because you're done installing. And to get from one step to the next, the node has to say, I'm done with a certain step. Razor comes with a number of installers. They're kind of the most uh, annoying thing to, to write. Um, not so much because of what you need to do for Razor, but just because some, some operating systems are harder to automate than others for installation. Um, so we have installers for you know, the various RHEL flavors, RHEL CentOS, uh, you can use it for Fedora too. We have, similarly, we have install, an installer for various Debian flavors, Ubuntu. You know, some guy actually just polished it up to, to uh, work right with uh, Ubuntu 12.04 LTS. And then, a very recent addition are the two other installers I showed there. One is uh, an installer for ESXi. That was actually the initial, I think the initial use case 
to write Razor was provisioning ESXi on hosts in the data center, given where you know, Nick and Tom work. Not a surprise. Surprise is how hard it is to get ESX rolled out in an automated way. I don't know how many of you have tried that. It's, it's uh, gut-wrenching. Um, there's yeah, lots of weird things you have to do. And then finally, something we just added is an installer for Windows. I think right now it only works with Windows 8. But that means, you know, and we'll, we'll expand that um, over time, but that means you can use you know, Razor to provision all these things, hopefully all the OSs you use uh, in your data center um, you know, with one solution. Okay, so I just want to go through a few examples of, because right now I'm sure it's kind of nebulous, the various things I said you need to set up on your server. Um, just go through a few examples of what they look like. And the first one is um, a tag. So a tag is really just a name and then a rule that looks like this. And if you squint hard enough, it looks, it looks a little bit like an S expression, but uh, like, like a Lisp type you know, expression. Um, it's really just JSON um, that looks a lot like that. So what this thing says is if either of these two conditions is true, this tag will apply. Um, the first condition is if the MAC address is one of the ones given here, then this, this thing will apply. Or if the node has exactly two uh, CPUs, then this tag will apply too. So there's a lot of, <coughs> yeah, and, and with these, yeah, of course there's not equals and greater than and, and things like that. And with access to the facts about a node and the sort of logic language, language, you can actually express a lot of complexity about you know, your nodes and classify them in, in fairly fine-grained ways. So yeah, if, if one of these tags matches, um, yeah, the node is tagged with that. Um, and we'll, we'll see later how, how that is reflected in the policy. The other thing you need is an installer. And as I said, the, besides the things you need anyway to automate installation of your operating system via Pixie, this is all you need uh, on top of that. These, yeah, I don't know, five lines of YAML. Um, most of it is just information. The really Im important thing is this thing here, which says the first time this node boots into this installer, use the boot install template, which is another file that you know, comes with the installer. Um, and then after that, once the node has told you it's successfully done this stage here, from then on just use the boot local template um, to boot. And kind of jumbled up my slides, I think. Yeah, let me do this first. So this is what, for example, the boot install template looks like. It's an ERB template, um, and it really talks about, uh, this, is, this is just one line from it, right? It talks about, we want a certain kernel and a certain kickstart. And these little helpers here generate URLs. This is actually a little subtle. These helpers just generate URLs, and then the, you know, this text with KS equals some URL gets sent down to the node. Um, the, the, the installer running on the node will then request that from, make a request against the URL to the server, which then sends it down the, you know, the kickstart, the actual kickstart file. Similarly for, um, for the kernel, we say repo URL here because we want to pull something out of the kind of the, the repository, the binary content that's associated with the policy we're installing. So you can think of this, uh, this as the file vmlinus on your install ISO um, or install CD. And uh, below is an excerpt from, from kind of the post install script for the rel installer, um, where we say, you know, set the host name to whatever is stored as the host name attribute of the node we're, we're installing currently. And down here, we install a bunch of packages. And if that works out, we'll, we log something on the server, and if it doesn't work out, we lock something else. So I glossed over the, the broker for, this is an example of what a Puppet broker would look like. Um, all you need to say there is that you're using the Puppet broker type, um, which is again, a couple scripts somewhere um, that ultimately cause the Puppet agent to be installed on the system and you know, the Puppet agent then talking to the Puppet master. And so the, the important things that the, 
the most important thing that the Puppet Broker needs is where uh, the, um, the name of where your Puppet Master lives. Um, and the other two you, yeah, aren't that important, but you can say that if I use this Puppet Broker with a node, it should uh, automatically go into the production environment. Okay, and tying this all together is the policy. The policy is kind of where all these different things we've set up come together, um, and where you say, you know, this is a policy to install CentOS. You say, use the CentOS 6.4 repository. Um, this is where all your packages and you know, the various bits live. Um, use the CentOS installer, which is the kickstart files and templates and whatnot. Um, I want to use the Puppet broker I just set up. Um, down there is a little bit of metadata that gets filled in as soon as a policy is applied to a node, as soon as that policy matches the node. Um, we set the node's host name according to this little template there. We set a root password on the node too, um, yeah, mo mostly as a convenience. Um, you can turn policies on and off by you know, f flipping this enabled flag. Uh, you might want to, for some time, not use some policy, so you can just turn it off, or um, yeah, to, to have some other policy take precedence. And you can also say how many nodes you want to have at the most using this policy. So you can say, I only want five database servers. And you set the max count here to five. <coughs> um, and then the rule number. So policies are organized in a table, and Razor just goes through that table one by one, and the first policy that matches a node gets applied to it. So you know, earlier, rules, uh, earlier policies take precedence over later policies. Um, and yeah, the rule number is a way for you to organize this table to, to um, sort these policies into the table. And finally, you have to say what tags this, this policy uses. As soon as a node comes by that has all the tags that I mentioned here in the policy, that, that policy applies to the, uh, to the node. And that's uh, kind of kind of the uh, long and short of Razor, and yeah, I think you should, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen this movie, um, you should maybe think of your nodes not so much as cattle, but as yeah, little helpers that help you do even more evil. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, as one example of you know, kind of the cool things you can do something like with something like Razor, I wanted to talk about cloud a little bit, mostly about you, know, you have a bunch of physical systems and you want to you know, install some, some cloud on it. And one of the things you might want to put on there is you know, VMware, vCloud, what have you. Um, and to do that, that's actually pretty easy um, in that you just use the ESXi installer in your policy, which you know, puts down the ESXi nodes, and then you, know, you use a special broker that actually um, yeah, that actually talks to your Puppet Master. On your Puppet Master, you have to have a module from the Forge. There's a vCenter module that takes care of all the weird munging and actually talking to vCenter at the end of the day. So Razor, once it's installed a node with ESX, uh, it goes to the Puppet Master and says, hey, here's a new node, and I installed ESX on it, and here's some details about it. And then with this module, um, the Puppet Master will actually go and tell vCenter about the nodes that are out there uh, and enroll them with vCenter. And then you know, all of a sudden, you know, basically, you turn on a machine, and at some point, it shows up in your vCenter. The whole thing is fully automated. Another one is, I don't know how many of you have played with OpenStack or used OpenStack, tried to get OpenStack going. Um, I mean, OpenStack has their own provisioning solution, which is kind of fledgling. Um, but this is uh, a very cool way to, to set up OpenStack. Um, again, you need uh, some modules from the Forge. We have these OpenStack modules that you, know, you can use to manage all kinds of aspects, or pretty much anything, uh, in OpenStack. And I, initially, I wanted to do a demo, but I didn't think I would have time for that. Um, so what you need for these OpenStack modules to, to set up a cloud with them is um, you need two networks. The red network is kind of your provisioning network, and then a green network, which later on the virtual machines that run off th on these hosts will use to communicate. 
Um, yeah, and I see the, the slides kind of still show the VMware logo uh, instead of, yeah, of course, you're not installing ESX on those nodes. You're probably installing some sort of KVM based hypervisor on those nodes. Um, and what that looks like in, in, terms of, um, in terms of Razor is this is one, there's two kinds of nodes um, in, in the simplest setup. One is you know, a controller node that runs you know, kind of the pretty much all the OpenStack services besides the actual Nova compute, and there's a compute node or many compute nodes that run just one of those OpenStack services. Like the other OpenStack services are things like um, Glance, which is the image store, um, maybe some, some networking service, um, Keystone, which, is the, which handles authentication. Um, there's a database MySQL on the controller node and all these things. But all you have to do to kind of get this setup going or similar setups is you write one policy for the controller node. Um, and here I've, I've pegged the max count to one. So I only ever will get one controller node that looks like this. Um, for the installer, you just use a stock Fedora or whatnot installer. You don't even need to worry about anything OpenStack specific. Um, yeah, and so you, you, you use this p policy and then a second policy for compute nodes. Um, and they, yeah, they pretty much look, it pretty much looks the same except for the highlighted things that I had changed. Like I changed the rule number, there's a different tag. For example, in my, you know, when I ran this on my laptop, I gave the controller node two disks and the compute nodes only one, and so I distinguished between the two of them by whether they had only one disk or two. And in your Puppet manifest, this is pretty much the entire Puppet manifest you need to get this going. You say if the host name of the node has controller in it, you use you know, the OpenStack controller class and a bunch of you know, networking information. If the host name has compute in it, um, we use the OpenStack compute class, again, a bunch of um, network information by basically to make all the nodes, th those nodes find each other, and that's pretty much it. And then you turn on the machines and everything after that um, just works, or hopefully works. Yeah. So basically, Razor and Puppet together are you know, a really powerful tool to fully automate. You know, in my, uh, I like to talk about Razor as serving not the last mile problem, but the first mile problem, you know, the problem of actually getting Puppet bootstrapped on, on the machine. Um, and then yeah, Puppet can do the rest of uh, the things. So what does the future look like for Razor? Um, besides Pixie provisioning, I, I look at Razor as a kind of a machine lifecycle um, tool that you, know, you should be able to use during the whole lifecycle of, of a physical hardware. Or, I mean, everything I talked about also works with virtual machines if you pixie boot your virtual machines. Um, but you know, things like BIOS updates, for example, um, should be possible with Razor. So there's a lot more commands that you know, both the microkernel should understand and things that clients should be able to put in there, um, like, yeah, like a command to boot into a BIOS update image, right? Just boot into this thing once and then go back to booting locally to whatever was installed on the machine, um, together with a tag language that, uh, that lets you hopefully select which machines actually need that BIOS update, right? So you could, as the client, you could say all machines that look like this boot into this, this firmware or BIOS update image. Um, and yeah, by, yeah. Um, and it may, might take you a while because, because some of these machines that are that should get the update might be running something. So it might not happen until the next scheduled reboot of that machine. If they're running the microkernel, it'll happen you know, in a few seconds. Um, other things that um, yeah that you could do there is um, reinstall the OS, for example. Um, or rediscover the node, you might have a newer microkernel that you know, collects more facts than what you did initially when you, when you discover that image, uh, that, that node. Um, so similar to like a BIOS update, you might want to boot into a microkernel once and then go back to whatever the system was doing. Um, another thing that's really important if you have other external systems managing you know, or managing some aspects of your 
your machines is you know, a way to generate events, like you know, to tell a CMDB that a machine has shown up, right? That it has has booted. Um, so that's that's kind of the other big thing I want to do in uh, in Razor. One thing we don't have right now, um, but that's that Daniel's working on right now, is um, controlling the power of your nodes. So using IPMI to turn machines on and off. Right now we just rely on you to do that somehow somehow um, out of band. But you know, once we have that, we can offer a, a, a public API that actually lets you, you know, boot up and down machines. So you can boot up a machine, discover it, inventory it, uh, and then power it down. And when Razor decides that something should go on the machine, Razor can power the thing back up for you and install something on it. OK, that was it in a nutshell. Um, wow, OpenOffice, uh, I don't know if anybody can read the links on there. I don't know why OpenOffice decides to make them light gray on white background. Um, yeah, there's yeah, IRC channels at the bottom, my email address, if you want to sign me up for cat pictures or stuff like that. Um, OK, so with that, thanks for, your, uh, for listening. And are there any questions? Can you use custom facts during the initial node discovery phase? Right now, that would require that you rebuild the microkernel, or at least crack it open and put some external facts in there. But yeah, yeah, uh, we would like to make that easier in the future. But it's definitely possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is, what if I buy you know, 200 machines a year that, that all are basically the same hardware, but are supposed to do different things? Um, how can I distinguish those? If you can't tell from inside the machine, um, if they're really you know, the same machine, then you know, what, you know, do you even need to distinguish between them? If, you're, if, if they're in different network, Yeah, no, no, what I'm saying is that if you have 200 machines that are all the exact same thing, um, then you, know, you don't need to, and you have three or four different types of installs that you want to perform, you don't necessarily have to, to um, subdivide the, those 200 machines into three or four groups. You just have to set on your policy, for example, you, bump that max, you, know, you set that max count to however many you want right now. And if you want one more of this type, uh, you increase the max count by one, and Razor will pick one of those identical machines and install on it. Um, and yeah, then you're ins and you use different installers there. And you, would, you might have one installer for your database and one installer for your web servers. They might lay down the exact same OS, but this might do different partitioning or something like that. Um, yeah, whether you want to do that with different installers or one installer that is more templated, where the partitioning, for example, is just templated out, um, is, uh, is something that depends on the specific ca use case. Yes. I actually got two questions. <coughs> First one being, um, if I should manage my servers like cattle, mm -hmm. I would like to name them like pets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you want to manage your server like cattle, but you uh, want to name them like pets, how do you do that? Right now, the um, kind of the where did I have the, this thing here, right? The host name line here is pretty restri is restricted in that all we give, give you is an ID, which is a num some number. Um, there's a lot of people on the mailing list who would want to have more you know, pet-like names for their machines. Um, it depends a little bit on what you want to do. Um, one, yeah, uh, sometimes people just want to have them uh, yeah, numbered 
using different schemes or um, use some facts in that, and those are things we need to add to the, the stuff you can put into the dollar parentheses things. If you're, it depends on where, you know, where the information for your naming comes from. If it's based on facts, it would actually be a really simple change to do that. If it's something that needs to be generated, for example, you know, they should, be, should have numbers from, you know, they should be called web server 50 through 60 or something like that. Um, that would require a little more uh, headache, I think, on the impl implementation side, just to make sure you, you, know, you, re you reuse gaps that, you know, as you decommission something, Razor notices that 55 is free, uh, is available now, those things. But yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on the very specific kind of naming scheme you have in mind. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of ways to do that right now. Uh, David, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, what if uh, you're not using Pixie? What if you uh, don't have DHCP turned on in your data center or you know, things of that nature? Um, so you can either take the microkernel directly and stick that. I mean, let me just think if that would work. Um, I mean, what, what definitely works is if you burn you know, the iPixie firmware to, to some media, like a CD or something like that, and boot from that. Um, because Razer doesn't, doesn't care if um, you know, the iPixie firmware was downloaded or via TFTP or some other means, or just sits there in a CD or, or something like that. Um, it might screw a little bit with your local booting. I'm not sure. But essentially, yeah, that, that's the idea. Put some media in there that... I assume that's what you're doing today if you're not using Pixie. Yeah, it's basically the yeah. image that we can yeah. some of the Yeah. Okay. More yes. Um, you just said that you are able to command the system to keep it when it's hard and to do some kind of uh, BIOS updates or mm -hmm. whatever. How is that achieved? Is there some sort of razor demon that's running my operating system? Um okay, yeah. So um I said that you can tell um, the, the node to reboot and then you know, run some BIOS update image. Um, there's, yeah, that's not quite true. I mean, yeah, that's not what I meant um, <laughs> when I said that. Um, the one thing is, if the, if the node is running the microkernel, we can tell it to reboot immediately because it's sitting there and asking the server all the time what to do. We don't put a, a, a Razor daemon or anything in the operating system that gets installed. And for that to reboot, you, you have to wait until the machine gets rebooted for some other reason, right? that you know, somebody manually reboots it, or you know, once we have IPMI control, we could actually let you do that through the Razor interface that you can say, you know, these machines, reboot them now, and you know, then boot into some, some um, BIOS update image, for example. Are there yes. plans for some a little bit more sophisticated deployments? Uh, for example, let's say we have So is there Yeah. So yeah, so the question is if if uh, you have to do more complicated things like you know, on an HP ProLiant rate setup that requires you to enter a license key, other ways to do it. Um, right now we don't have support for a pool of licenses. If you have some external service that that does that for you, you could just fetch yeah, fetch it from there because you know, your, your node, all, all it has to, do, to be able to do is talk HTTP to some other service. And we can, you know, Razor can certainly help you construct that URL in a way that makes sense to your license management thing. Um, the, the question of you know, these sort of pools comes up a lot, mostly in the, in the context of um, networking and assigning IP addresses, where you want to say, you know, where you kind of want to use Razor as a poor man's DHCP server that generates you know, an IP address on installation and then you know, uses that to, to set up static networking on the, in the OS. Um, it's also something we, need, you know, we want to do, we haven't done yet. Okay, yeah. 
More questions? Yeah. Go 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 to the GitHub repo. No, it's um, it's uh, it's open source under the ASL like Puppet. Um, it will show up in Puppet Enterprise two um, very likely in the next release three dot two that we're going to to make. Um, but yeah, everything I talked about right now is in the open source version. There. Okay, and with that, thanks a lot. And uh, if you have more questions, I'll be here all day. Thank you.